Okay. I think we're ready to go. <laughs> we don't have any announcement slides sold today. Okay, so give me the high sign. <laughs> we're going. Good morning. Welcome to Point Plus United Methodist. So this is a big day. We are reopening uh, after um, the Omicron required us, or we felt the need to, uh, to do live stream only, at least for first service. And so we're back. And so welcome. I want to welcome those that are here. Good to have you. Welcome, welcome. So we also have experienced Omicron in a, in a challenging way. Uh, our copier toner um, is on a ship yet to be unloaded in Long Beach Harbor. <laughs> and so we didn't have a copier this last week, which was a crazy thing. And that's, that's made this morning a little crazier than normal. But we are, we're going to worship God on this day. We're going to share in communion. And we're going to think about um, confronting our fears and the power of Christ's call upon our life and how those two fit together. All right, Ben, I'm going to have you share everything else, everything. and you're going to have to do it off the top of your head. See, the problem with that is the more I do things off the top of my head, the less there is on the top of the head, so I'm, I'm going to try not to do that today. Anyway, good morning, church. Uh, it's good to be with you. Uh, we got our normal slate of activities this week, so as always, if you're looking for some place uh, to plug in and find some community uh, those options are available. Uh, I would bring up a specific note, though. Next Saturday, which is February 12th, uh, it's Valentine's Drive-In Movie Evening. So uh, we will have a family-friendly movie uh, that should work for all generations. Uh, we're going to encourage uh, folks to get here around 530. You have an opportunity to fellowship and chat with people. Uh, we will also have a heart-shaped uh, sugar cookies that will have been baked. And by the way, we are looking for folks from the congregation who would be willing to bake a couple dozen sugar cookies. We may have a ton, Sonia. That'll be fantastic. Then we can give them out for fellowship time the next day. I didn't talk, we didn't talk about that, but it sounds good to me. Anyway, we'll be, uh, we'll be decorating some uh, Valentine's cookie before the movie starts. Uh, we're also going to be providing dinner. Uh, we're going to have hot dogs. There's going to be nachos. We'll have chili to throw on top of those things. And as always, it's a movie, so we'll have popcorn and, and uh, hot beverages. So uh, regardless of your age, come on out and join us. Uh, we, we do it so you listen through your car. You, you tune in on your radio. Uh, listen to it. Bring chairs out. Sit in the back of your vehicle. There's all sorts of folks out. It's always a good time. So uh, we're going to do that on Saturday evening. Again, starting at 5.30, the movie will probably start around 6.15 or so when it's dark enough. Uh, and you'll get an email this week with what the movie is. We're, uh, we're keeping up the suspense, or we haven't picked it yet. I'll leave that up to you to figure out. Anyway, uh, as always, there are places to get together. And as the body of Christ, we are called to be together when we have the opportunity. So uh, we'll be doing it outside, behind the back of the ministry center. Um, so it'll be a safe opportunity to get together. We we'll hope to see you there. Good morning. Our opening song this morning is Everlasting God. Let's stand up.
Good morning. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship from 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love. For perfect love casts out fear. Fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We come to, to worship, worship the, the God, God who is love. love who invites us to confront our fears that we might nudge our lives a little closer towards perfect love, the very substance of God. Amen.
was his one and only son to save. Jesus is waiting, God so loved the world. It is a joy to have kids back here on campus this morning. Amen. From Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Once, while Jesus was standing beside the Sea of Galilee, the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God. He saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put it out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. In the children's activity bags this week, you have puzzle and coloring pages crayons and a pencil. You also have a Fishers of People foam sticker set to put together, and a finished sticker set is pictured at the top of the page. Thank you for remembering to bring cans of food for people who are hungry here in Elk Grove. The food collection box is always on the turquoise table in front of the ministry center. You can pick up your very own activity bag any day, any time from the box on the turquoise table in front of the ministry center. And don't forget about the newest box on the turquoise table. If you have finished artwork or papers to share with your church family, leave them in the box, and we will put them up on the lobby wall inside for everyone to enjoy. Or if you bring them on a Sunday, you're welcome to use the available tape and stapler and put them up yourselves. Thank you. Prodding and behooving 
moving There is no time to be losing Let us pray Let the Father hear us saying What we need to be conveying Even while the song is playing Let us pray And because we say the words Amen It doesn't mean this conversation needs to end Let us pray Pray everywhere and every way, every moment of the day, it is the right time. Let us pray without end, and when we finish, start again. Like breathing out and breathing in, no, let us pray. Let us approach the throne of grace with confidence as our prayers draw. Everywhere and every way, every moment of the day, it is the right time. For the Father above, He is listening with us, and He wants to answer us. So let us pray, let us pray. Everywhere and every way, every moment of the day, it is the right time. Let us pray without Him, and when we finish, start again. Like breathing out and breathing in Oh, let us pray So you may have seen me bring in the bread and the cup. This is a communion Sunday. For those of you that are at home, if, if you could get uh, some form of the communion elements ready, uh, we're going to move right in from the sermon into, uh, into communion. And um, it can be any, any form of bread or crackers, and it can be uh, juice or wine or water. Um, all of those will work just fine. So the title of the sermon is Confronting Our Fears and Hearing the Call of God. And um, what I want to do is I want to read the scripture. Sonia read through a, a portion. I'm going to read um, the whole story. It's the call of the first disciples, uh, the call of Peter. Now, kind of interesting thing. It almost sounds like this is the first time they saw Jesus, uh, which really doesn't make a lot of sense. And But it's not. In the Gospel of John, it makes it clear that that Peter and James uh, and John, his brother Andrew, they were followers of John the Baptist. And uh, John the Baptist started this incredible movement that was affecting uh, lots and lots of people, drawing people to God, a message of repentance, to draw near to God. And uh, Jesus, in a sense, picks up, as John is imprisoned and eventually his head cut off, uh, Jesus picks it up and many of John's followers become Jesus followers. So this is... When, when Jesus calls Peter, uh, there's a little background there. They, they knew all about, they knew quite a bit about him already. All right, so let's um, hear the story. Now, what I want you to listen for is, is look for the fear and then look how Jesus responds to the fear. Okay. From the fifth chapter of Luke, the call of Simon Peter. Once while Jesus was standing beside the Sea of Galilee and the crowd was pressing in on, on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore uh, of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. They got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowd from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long. But we have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners and other boats to come and help them. And they began to fill both boats. So they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, 
he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that, that they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to the shore, they left everything and followed him. I missed the last slide. That's all right. They left everything and followed him. All right, so in this scripture, uh, in the presence of Jesus, Peter's initial self-assessment as he sees, as he sees something uh, that represents uh, uh, the presence of God, the power of God, the glory of God, or what we might call the, the kingdom of God there in his midst, this miraculous power of Jesus, and, and probably simply the presence of Jesus. It says, when Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. And Jesus' response to Peter is to call him. Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching people. You don't need to be afraid. You don't need to be afraid. Come and be a part of me. Come and be a part of what I am about. So one of the most helpful sources to kind of take the Christian faith and put it into a form that, that often makes sense has been C.S. Lewis. He died almost 60 years ago, but he's as popular today as, as ever. And his book, Mere Christianity, um, often presents the faith in a way, more than any other book, it presents the Christian faith in a way that, that uh, millions of people have grabbed hold of and able to make sense. So C.S. Lewis um, describes there being three driving forces in life. These are the three. This is universal. This is for all of us. And we, we, uh, we sort of choose which of these forces are going to be the driver. Or sometimes they choose us. But in a sense that these are the three. And by the way, nobody is purely in just one of these. We're almost always a composite. But here are the, here are the three drivers in life. So it's kind of think about the way you live your life and the things you do and the things you don't do. Why do you do the things you do and things you don't do the things you don't do? All right, so the number one uh, there, and, and these are just in, in the order, they're, they're not in, in priority. Actually, they're in reverse, reverse priority, I guess you would say, but well, they're in, anyway, these are the three. <laughs> the first one is pursuing materialistic self-interest, pleasure, or status. The goods of the world, you know, the rewards of life and hard work in the world, that's certainly a part of life, right? We have to feed ourselves and our families, and so we, we work. And, and um, uh, of course, that can get out of hand, right? You know, that idea, the person who dies with the most toys wins, you know, and crazy ideas like that. But that's one driver in life. We're all affected by that. A second driver in life is often kind of has this internal dimension. It's fear, Fear is often a huge driver in life. Fear of divine or human consequences, uh, fear of failure, fear of punishment, fear of going to hell, not going to heaven, and a scat of others. And this is immense. You know the, the term phobia? Phobia just means fear. So just think of all the phobias that exist. You're talking about a huge part of life. These are all drivers in life, right? Fear. Fear is a powerful driver. Well, C.S. Lewis says, there's only one other driver in life. That's right. The only other driver is the call of God. The call of God to be a part of the work of God, uh, to realize, to build the kingdom of God. And this is incarnational. Uh, at least in the Christian faith, we understand as incarnational that the spirit of God gets into us and that we participate in a sense with the movement of God. So these three forces in life. So in, in, in the story, I've color-coded these, um, red for fear, green for life. Uh, and what you, what you see is in the story, uh, it starts off with Peter, Peter in fear. And then it ends with life. And so fear 
Fear is, is, is the starting point. And it's, 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 it's kind of an overwhelming fear. Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. There's this idea that often when we come into the presence of the holy, we become aware of our own unholiness. And that certainly is the case with, with Peter. Okay. So what about, what is the green? What is, what is that? Well, the movement is from fear, then Jesus responds responds as Jesus, as, as Peter, in a sense, confesses and confronts his fear, Jesus responds by telling him there is a lifting out of fear. You don't need to be afraid. You don't need to be driven by fear. Do not be afraid, for now you'll be with me, catching people, building the kingdom of God. And so it moves from fear to the call to be a disciple. And in the call is this, in a sense, a lifting out of fear. Now, you could, all, you could argue, if you know the story of Peter, he goes back and forth. I mean, it's not like a one-time deal. And for the most of us, that's often the way it is. We may move from fear to a sense of, of, of being a part of the, the movement of God that propels us, and then sometimes we fall back into fear, and over and over and over again. So to go back to C.S. Lewis of these three, we're not going to focus so much on the first one. There's plenty of sermons we deal with that one. Um, um, But we're going to focus on fear and this idea of of the call of God, this this within us uh, movement of the Spirit of God. And what we're going to try to find is this dynamic. How do we move from fear away from fear to where life, instead of fear, which is incredibly destructive, empowers us. So let's think about, let's think about this. First of all, one of the first things that comes up whenever you talk about the call of God is we hear things like, well, I mean, isn't that just certain people? You know, the prophets got called by God or, um, or ministers maybe get called by God, but uh, well, that's one of the big changes between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, in the Old Testament, very few people are called. In the New Testament, while it begins with Peter and the disciples, eventually it extends out Jesus calling everyone. This is a radical change uh, in, in, in the faith. Uh, Jesus takes this idea of call and, and basically makes it universal. A number of scriptures where this comes out, but here's just a couple. Jesus said, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. So as long as you're in all people, you're a part of that. God works in Romans 8, 28, God works all things together for good for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. So all who seek to love God are are responding to this call, this call of God, the call. Okay, so, <clears throat> so when we get to two, fear, and then we see this movement to the call of God, this is a possibility for all of us. That's a big deal for C.S. Lewis. These are universal drivers. We, we can access all three of them. So let's think about fear. Fears often take hold of us. You know, it, it's like, I, I, I mean... And I don't want to diminish Jesus' words, but, but the idea when someone says, you know, don't, don't be afraid. I mean, that often unto itself, that's, that doesn't do too much, right? You know, don't be afraid. Uh, and the problem is, is, is fear is compulsive. Um, it functions like an addiction. We don't control it. It controls us. It's not, it's not like, oh, you know, no, I'm just going to set that aside. It's deeper than that. And... <clears throat> And often with addictions, um, addictions function in a certain way. Um, the, the reason why addictions have such a powerful hold on us in life is because we tend to deny them. We tend to say we don't have a problem or we hide the problem. And, and this is especially the case when it comes to fears. Um, we deny that we have fears. And one of the things we do is we project it on other people. And so, or another way to think about it is we see fear in others, 
but we don't see fear in ourselves. Right now, we're living a very polarized time, and there's a, a real good example of, of kind of the way this works. So if you talk to folks that are uh, liberals, they'll say, I, you know, I'm not afraid. It's those, you know, afraid of going to hell fundamentalists. They're always worried about hell and talking about hell. I mean, that's what they're, fear. They're, they're, they're the ones that are afraid. I'm not afraid. And then you talk to real conservative folks and they'll say, oh no, it's just those liberal snowflakes that run around like chicken littles, afraid of everything. The sky is falling, the sky is falling. It's all, you know, they're afraid of everything. Every, you know, that's, they're, they're afraid of things that aren't real. So that tendency is to never see the fear within ourselves, but to somehow see the fear in other people. And then we usually kind of demonize those folks. So denial is a big issue. And denial doesn't work very well. Um, the alternative denial is usually some sort of a workaround. So instead of really confronting a fear, we do something different. For example, one of the biggest fears that human beings have is fear of inadequacy. How many of us deal with fears of inadequacy? Yeah. Um, we fear that we're gonna fail. We fear that we don't measure up. And again, a lot of times it's locked deep within us. We hardly ever surface it. Um, what do people do when they have a fear of inadequacy, but they can't really confront it and deal with it? Um, one of the things they do is turn to hyper-religiosity or perfectionism, or sometimes I call it, you know, being the super Christian. And I can really relate to this. Um, in our first two churches, we were in very small towns. And being uh, the pastor of a church, you were highly visible. You lived in a fishbowl. And I remember sort of thinking, you know, we've, we can't just be run-of-the-mill Christians. That's not going to work. We're going to have to be super Christians. We are going to have to do everything right. You know what super Christians do? They basically, mad, you know, put on PR campaigns to let everybody know how they're not just pedestrian Christians, they're super Christians. And uh, let me tell you, it doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. That super Christian is a horrible trap. It's a horrible trap. And um, it usually greatly amplifies the fear of inadequacy because we can't live out what we want to do. So we end up putting a facade. And that often leads to, there's an arrow because there actually is a, a, a common uh, trajectory that, that when you can't deal with inadequacy and you, you, t you choose hyper-religiosity, um, it doesn't work. And a lot of times people walk away from the faith. I can tell you, I don't have fingers and toes to tell you the number of times people have told me a story about, you know, in a sense, trying to be the super Christian and eventually just walking away from the faith completely because it didn't work. So another fear that is pretty common, <laughs> fear of death. Oh, you, you've heard me share about that one, right? This is an existential fear. What that means is, is that it comes out of our existence. It's not like, you know, you can just avoid it. It just sort of emerges. Again, it it's often chooses us. We don't choose it. Uh, when you don't deal with those fears, um, they often come out in unwanted ways. Um, many, many experience, uh, something like 25% of the population experience panic attacks, serious panic attacks. Episod episodic panic attacks are almost universal. And not all panic attacks are rooted in fear of death, but, but fear of death often will take the form of, of a panic attack, especially when you lose people around you. It can lead to meaninglessness and depression. A lot of meaninglessness and depression is rooted in our fear of death and our denial of it. And this is, seems counterintuitive, but many of the times suicide, you would think like if you have a fear of death, suicide wouldn't, wouldn't fit that, but it's actually the fear that suicide seems to be an answer to it, to, to end the fear. So denial doesn't work. It doesn't work with the fear of death. It leads to all these things that are kind of epidemic in our society. Some of you remember um, David Bartley. Uh, three and a half years ago, we first brought David Bartley here. David Bartley is one of the, the top speakers in the United States on mental health and mental wellness. 
um, an amazing speaker. And uh, he shares his own story, his own struggle with depression and with panic and with suicide. And um, um, he came and shared, and, and, and a lot of us were just was deeply affected. In fact, so much so that we brought him back um, just before the pandemic struck. We had David, and he preached a couple times, and together um, we co-taught a class, uh, an eight-week class that pulls back the veil on life-destroying de- depression, anxiety, and panic attacks. And we dealt with that for eight weeks. It was one of the best classes that I have ever been a part of in uh, uh, ever. And um, what was amazing, we had 20 people. Uh, we averaged 20. I think we had about 26 different people that were a part of it. That's a, that's a lot of folks. And let me tell you, it's kind of vulnerable to go to a class on depression, anxiety, and panic, panic attacks. Well, one of the things we learned is, is that most of us deal with that, if not ourselves, within our circle of family and friends. Almost everybody has folks dealing with with issues around depression, anxiety, and panic attack, deep fears that we have. So this is a recent Pew Research survey. Now this is focusing on teens. Um, They were trying to understand anxiety and depression um, and a number of other things, uh, bullying, drug addiction, drinking alcohol, poverty, teen pregnancy, and gangs. And uh, so they, they did a survey, and it was of 13 to 17-year-olds. This was done just about three years ago. And what they found was the, the dark green, it's a little hard to see, but the dark green is a major problem, and the light green is a minor problem, and then the, what's left over is no problem. And so the, the number one, this is, you know, just talking to 13 to 17-year-olds, um, What's the biggest concern that you have in your circle of connection? Anxiety and depression, 96% identified it as a problem. That's, that's about as close to 100% as you'll get. So almost 100% of teenagers to say today say anxiety and, and depression and anxiety, they often talk about panic attacks. This is almost universal and then a whole lot of other things, right? So we're not talking about something that is, you know, just somebody else's problem. This is, this is close to us. And of course, for the most part, this doesn't just go away when you, <laughs> when you turn 18. I can, I can assure you of that, and you know that. Okay, so here we are. We've, we've been talking about fear. Um, how fear takes hold of us, this denial problem that we have, how fear is compulsive, it functions like an addiction, it controls us, we don't control it. We talked about the way we often push it on other people or see it in other people, but we have trouble seeing it in ourselves. We talked about how, how certain fears, like the fear of inadequacy, often leads to, when you don't deal with it, to sort of hyper religiosity, perfectionism, super Christianism, and that often leads to an abandonment of faith. When talking about death, uh, this existential fear, how it leads to, again, all sorts of things that are very destructive. Okay. So we've established pretty much this, this big fear stuff. Now look at the story and see this, see the motion of the story. It starts with Peter confessing, confessing. That's an important thing here. This is not Peter saying to himself, oh man, I'm I'm just inadequate. I can't measure. No, he confesses it. He confesses it to Jesus, confesses it to everyone around him. Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. There's There's an opening up. There's an engagement with his deepest fears. And I imagine Jesus smiles when that happens because that's, that's a glorious thing to happen. When we confess, we get to that point where we're no longer going to hide our fears. We confess them. And so Peter confesses his fears. And Jesus says, guess what? You don't need to be afraid. You don't need to be afraid. Isn't that an amazing statement? And the response to that is, come and be a part of the call of God. 
Come and be a part of the movement of God. Come and be a part of building the kingdom of God. Come and be a part of changing the world and changing your life. That's the response of Jesus. That's how the be not afraid becomes a reality, to be a disciple. It lifts us from fear. So in a sense, discipleship is, it comes out of confronting our fears. That's how it happens in the story. It's a movement from fear to grace and hope and peace and goodness and being a part of something bigger than myself. So, you gotta get, this is a big issue for me, okay? I mean, uh, not just because we had David Bartley come and, and, and so many of you shared that. I mean, this is, this is a huge part of life and life not working. Fear is epidemic. We're at the end of this, hopefully the end of this two-year pandemic, and it's been loaded with fear, hasn't it? And uh, we haven't dealt with it very well in a lot of ways, at least as a society and as a world. And, and so where do, we find, where do we find a good example of what this passage, what this scripture of what this call of God is about and the way it works. And I thought about examples, a good example, and the one that came back to me was from a sermon just two months ago, and uh, um, the end of that sermon in the person of Johnny Cash seemed to embody best that I could find of what happens to Peter and how this fear is resolved. And so we're gonna, we're gonna, if you are here, you'll be reminded. If you weren't, it'll be brand new. <laughs> but I think Johnny does a good job. All right, so we're going to pick it up uh, at the last chapter of his life. And uh, that's, the, that's within six months of his death in that picture. So I want to pick it up. Last couple years of his life. Um, Johnny is approaching his 70th year. And death is all around him. His, his close friend, Waylon Jennings, died in 2002. Johnny and Waylon roomed together and abused themselves with drugs and alcohol together in the early 60s. Johnny was now severely diabetic and his body was spent. The many years of drug and alcohol abuse had taken a toll. Yet what was hardest on Johnny was that June, his wife, her heart, her physical heart was failing. Johnny chose to confront his deepest fears, his addictions and his growing angst with death. He wanted to confront his fears. And he did it musically through the song, Hurt. So Hurt is a hard rock song, not Johnny's style, a hard rock song written by Trent Reznor. It is a dark existential, uh, dark existential lyrics confess self-inflicted harm and heroin addiction. Johnny was given the opportunity to cover the song and while initially he was scared, he was afraid, to do it. The more he looked at the song Hurt, the more he realized he needed to do the song. Johnny's own daughter, Roseanne, told her dad, Dad, do not do this song. Do not do the song Hurt. People will think that you are a heroin addict. <clears throat> People think you're a heroin addict. Johnny told Roseanne, I am an addict. And though I've been clean for 25 years, I want to remind people I want to remind people that that's a part of my life. I have done harm to myself, and the song speaks to me. The song is raw, a painful confession, and confession has always been my greatest strength in life and faith, and I think the song will also speak to many people. Plus, the song also deals with the pain of death, and I'm feeling the pain of death right now, so I'm going to do the song. If you haven't seen Johnny Cash's version of Hurt, just go home, Google Johnny Cash Hurt, and one of, the, one of the best known music videos in history will come up in this amazing song that begins with these words, I hurt myself today to see if I still feel. I focus on the pain, the only thing that's real. The needle tears a hole, the old familiar sting. Hurt was a huge, huge hit. 
It was not only a huge hit in terms of sales, it, it vaulted Johnny back into public consciousness in a way he hadn't been. In, in fact, it brought him to new heights. And the music video that Johnny made has become one of the most affirmed music videos ever. Hurt reintroduced Johnny to a new generation of people who previously were unaware of him and his music. Finally, Hurt prepared Johnny for 2003, the year that his wife of 35 years, June Carter Cash, would die on May 1st and September 3rd when Johnny would breathe his last. June's words to Johnny the day he died were connected to the catalyst of the song Hurt. She said, get to work. Johnny did just that. In the last four months of his life, he recorded 60 songs. Most of these songs were, you guessed it, deeply confessional and connected to the values of Jesus. Furthermore, with the power of the video that he made for the song Hurt, he had come to realize that many of these songs needed powerful creative videos to carry their message. So he started the Johnny Cash Project, that invited anyone who wanted to take this, these new songs that Johnny had recorded in 2003 and add their own creative music videos. Through the songs, they were released through a series of albums, one at a time, this was his plan, one album at a time every year for seven years, 2003, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and the last album coming out in 2010, seven years after he died. The first hit from the songs released after Johnny's death was Johnny doing an old spiritual. An old spiritual, God's going to cut you down. But Johnny took the old spiritual and made it confessional. It's about himself. He's talking about himself rather than making it preachy. It was another big hit. Song goes, you can run for a long time. You can run for a long time, run for a long time. Sooner or later, God will cut you down. Sooner or later, God will cut you down. Go tell that long-tongued liar. Go tell that midnight rider. Tell the rambler, the gambler, the backbiter. Tell them that God's going to cut them down. Tell them that God is going to cut them down. With the success of hurt and God's going to cut you down, Johnny's repentance laid in confession convictions were being shared with incredible power. Uh, what made it so powerful was that this was the same Johnny that had been doing this for 60 years. His first hit was Forceful in Prison Ruse, which is a confession where he identifies the plight of a prisoner and writes from that perspective. When I was a baby, my mama told me, son, always be a good boy. Don't ever play with guns. But I shot a man in Reno just to watch him die. When I hear the whistle blowing, I hang my head and cry. It was the same theme of repentance, confession, brutal honesty, vulnerability. It was as clear as ever. So yes, that part of his faith was alive and present as ever. But the question was, what about the other side? of repentance and confession? What about the call of God to not be afraid, to find the forgiveness, to find the grace? What about that transcendent hope? What about the other side of death? That was a question mark. And especially after recording Hurt, that was a question mark because in that song, Hurt probes death, but it doesn't poke through to the other side. <clears throat> or to put it in the words of the Apostle Paul that Johnny is so strongly connected with. Johnny wrote an autobiography on the Apostle Paul called The Man in White to contrast himself with The Man in Black. But these words of Paul in Romans 7 were words that Johnny always took to heart. I do not understand my own actions. I do not do what I want. I do the very thing I hate. Wretched man that I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Everybody knew that that part, that part was there. But what about the last part? that thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So <clears throat> the words of the Apostle Paul, Johnny's soulmate, captured the existential question. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Of course, Paul is able to answer, but would Johnny have an answer? Johnny would refer to himself as the greatest sinner in the world through his entire life. The confession was always there. It was, it was who he was. 
As a 12-year-old who took onto his own body the sin and guilt of his brother's jack death, his body nearly cut in half in a sawmill accident. As a 21-year-old who took on the sin and guilt of a prisoner who shot a man in Reno just to watch him die. In 1964, when Johnny took on the sin and guilt of the oppression and mistreatment of Native Americans through recording the ballad of Ira Hayes, and then confronted a music industry that boycotted him with a full-page ad in Billboard magazine asking, <clears throat> he took out a full page ad in Billboard asking, where are your guts? Play the song. And adding particular hand gesture, if you know that picture of him. In 1970, when Johnny took on the sin and guilt of a nation caught up in a morally indefensible war in Vietnam, and he became the first country music star to speak out against the war. In 2002, the year before he died, when he took on the sin and guilt of heroin addiction, in his raw and confessional version of the song, Hurt. But what about that transcendent hope? Did Johnny come to know that transcendent hope and grace that resounds in Paul's words? Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God. In 2010, Johnny's final album was released. It was entitled, Ain't No Grave Can Hold My Body Down. And that existential question that Johnny had confessed to the world in the song Hurt, that probes death but did not push through the other side, finds resolution and hope and grace and peace and joy in all the songs that made up the album, but none more than the title song for the album, Ain't No Grave, which affirmed that Johnny's willingness to face and confess his fears ended just like Paul's confession ends with transcendent words of life and eternal life. There ain't no grave can hold my body down. Ain't no grave can hold my body down. When I hear that trumpet sound, I'm gonna rise right out of the ground. Ain't no grave can hold my body down. And because of the intensity of Johnny's vulnerable confession of his fears of guilt, not just through the song Hurt, but through his entire life, this song came forth with incredible power, like a, a, an unexpected surprise. In some ways, it's just like it was for Peter. I mean, Peter was utterly surprised as he confesses his sin, his guilt. He expects nothing but shame, but instead he receives these words from Jesus lifting him out of his fears. You don't need to be afraid. You don't need to be afraid. And that's what sort of jumps out of the scripture today. That movement from confession of fear and guilt, which is so much a part of our lives, though we wish it wasn't. To Jesus' gracious blessing, you don't need to be afraid. You don't need to be afraid. I don't need to be afraid. You don't need to be afraid, Simon Peter. And it hits Peter completely unexpectedly. It comes as an unanticipated surprise gift. But it's not just a surprise to Peter. It's an incredible surprise that lies at the heart of every follower of Jesus Christ. Because this is the heart of Christianity. This little story, right, this call story, this movement from fear to grace, to hope, to peace, found in, in, in you don't need to be afraid. When we humbly and vulnerably confess our guilt and fears, our inadequacies, our failures, our addictions, our super Christian obsessions, that essential prerequisite for receiving the calling of God, that is required. There's no other way but through giving that up. When we do that, we receive the gift of God, the fruit of the calling, nothing less than the kingdom of God, the most beautiful and exquisite and blissful surprise in all of life, as it was for Peter, as it was for the Apostle Paul, as it was for Johnny, and as it is for each of us. This is how it works. Amen.
And so we now we move to another scary time in Jesus' life as he was preparing to die and, and his disciples were deeply afraid, deeply afraid. Communion comes in the context of fear. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, as he was preparing for his death, and as he was preparing us for life and death and resurrection, he took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Take and eat this remembering me, remembering my teachings, but especially remember my calling. Remember what happened in that boat with Peter. Remember his confession and remember those words, be not afraid. And then Jesus took the cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you. This cup is my blood of a new covenant, a new way of being in relationship and living out the kingdom of God. Shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. As often as you eat of these and drink of these, do so remembering me. So let's do that this day. But as you take the bread and as you take the cup, I want you to know that this speaks to the deepest fears that lie within you this day and the deepest fears that will ever lie within you. And so receive it knowing that that's what it's for. The blood of Christ shed for the lifting of that fear. Well, Lord, thank you for the incredible good news this day. Thank you for the way that Peter is called. Thank you for his confession of his deepest fears, of his guilt and shame. And thank you for the response that comes from Jesus. Be not afraid. We don't need to be afraid. Well, Lord, may we go forth participating in that same movement, that same drama, that same confession, and that same surprising grace. Amen.
So just to know before the benediction that uh, we trust you to make the, the wise choice in how to navigate the pandemic in terms of worship. We're gonna, um, we are now opening up uh, first service and second service is gonna be drive in this week and next and then it too will move inside. And um, at the same time, we're gonna continue the live stream and we trust you to make the right decision. And as, as you feel, um, uh, what works for you and for your family. So know that. And finally, for those of you that are here, uh, you get your choice of retro treats. Yeah, those have gone over real well, uh, the, the drive-in treats, and so they're on the way out. Please bow for the benediction. Oh Lord, we have many fears, and many of them we hardly ever reveal even to ourselves. And so, Lord, it is truly amazing good news that you come to lift us out of our fears and our guilt and our shame. May we respond to that call from you. Amen.